And that's a very overgeneralized list, I would argue. Yeah, and it also discounts that there are certain flavors of ISFPs that can do more traditional roles. Yeah. And because that's a that's a almost a romantic list, I would say. Yeah, well, I mean, I think today what we want to do is lay down some principles to make really good choices for you as an ISFP going through your career rather than a topic or, oh, well, the internet said I'm supposed to go for this, so I guess that's the career I'll choose. No, there's probably ways you lean into the energies you bring into the world that are tailored to you and how you want to approach your career life. Oh, ISFPs love the phrase tailored to you. Hi, welcome back to the Personality Hacker Podcast. My name is Joel Mark Witt. And I'm Antonia Dodge. So today we are talking about ISFPs, the ISFP personality type, and careers. Now, you might be an ISFP listening, so we're going to talk about you and your personality type related to career, or you might know somebody or have an ISFP in your life. Maybe they work for you or work with you. This might be a very interesting insight into how ISFPs show up to the working world. And we're going to approach this through a very particular lens today, Antonia, the idea of expressions of the ISFP, four different expressions of the ISFP uh, personality type. Right. So one of the reasons why we're talking about this, just to add a little context, is that we've been um, we've been doing this uh, personality life path mentorship for a little while now, and we're noticing that people are showing up to these to this particular mentorship group, but in general, any of our mentorships, because they're in a time period of transition. Yeah. And right now, careers seem to be on people's minds. Like, what is the right career for me? A lot of people are in career changes, and it's just like a general time period of reflection. And so because of that, we've also noticed that when you go online to look for information around type and careers, mm. there can be a, I mean, of course, the internet is doing its best to try to compile all the best, yeah. you know, uh, suggestions, but it can be a little limiting, actually, uh, sometimes based on stereotypes, sometimes based on just certain flavors of each of the types. Yeah. And so we wanted to unpack uh, a little bit more about the different ways that each of the types can show up, in this case, ISFPs, and how that might impact their career and how their impact or their career might actually impact them. Absolutely. So I did my internet research, by the way. Yeah. I went out to the internets and I came up with an anecdotal top 10 list for ISFPs and career choices. Now, this is just me doing some searching and you know, pulling together a top 10 list. This is not a definitive list, but this is basically what the internets tell me is the best career for ISFPs. Are you ready? I don't think people know that when you say internets, you're being Funny. ironic. <laughs> it's like an old, maybe it, it's an old Gen X term. We're at, a, we're at a time period where we're old enough so that if we say things ironically, people don't take them ironically anymore. I've noticed that. People have a hard time with parody. They don't, they take it too serious now. It's Somebody's going to say, it's not internets, it's internet. And it's like, yeah, that's a joke. <laughs> Well, anyway, you want to hear the top 10 list I for ISFPs. Okay, so here's uh, artist, fine artist, graphic designer in particular. Uh, number two, interior designer. Three, chef. Four, conservationist environmental scientist. Five, musician. Six, fashion designer. Seven, landscape architect, architect art therapist, athlete, and veterinarian. Yeah, that's those not the, bad. Those are the top 10 that the, the internet, <laughs> singular, not plural, uh, told me are the career choices for ISFPs. Now... You might be an ISFP listening or know an ISFP that doesn't have one of those careers. And that's a very overgeneralized list, I would argue. Yeah. And it also discounts that there are certain flavors of ISFPs that can do more traditional roles. Yeah. And because that's a that's a almost a romantic list, I would say. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think today what we want to do is lay down some principles to make really good choices for you as an ISFP going through your career Rather than a topic or, oh, well, the internet said I'm supposed to go for this, so I guess that's the career I'll choose. No, there's probably ways you lean into the energies you bring into the world that are tailored to you and how you want to approach your career life. Oh, ISFPs love the phrase tailored to you. Oh, yeah. Right? So let's talk about the premise that we're working with in this conversation or sort of the foundational model which is borrowed from our friend, Dr. Dario Nardi, who did a, um, a series of EEG machine scan-led research around how the same personality type can manifest in multiple subtypes. Now, uh, Dario was reluctant to call these subtypes because he wanted to give people the idea that actually this is flexible. Yeah. If you look at things in terms of you know, nature and nurture, 
Nature is our pre-wiring. It's what we come with. And it looks like our personality type, our Myers-Briggs personality type is is more nature. It's a pre-wired, you know, sort of a, a way that we are pre-wired to experience the world and the things that we tend to be focused upon. But our subtype or our flavor is more nurture. It's more how we are treated and responded to and the things we're rewarded for uh, in our development. And when we're growing up and even after the age of 25, and this is why it's particularly relevant, our career choice, Mm. the thing we're spending a lot of our time doing will also have an impact on how we show up. This is expression of type. This is the way we express our personality type. This isn't necessarily the cognitive functions of our mind. Right, we're exactly. We're talking about here. Right, although that does come in. So we'll yeah. talk a little bit about how that um, gets woven in. So depending upon your flavor of, of the ISFP type, you're going to be attracted to different styles of careers. And in fact, the career you chose might be influencing that very subtype it might be hmm. it might be influencing how you're showing up so there's a relationship between yourself and where you're spending a chunk of change all your time doing you know problem solving and focus and you know effectively interacting with this thing that your livelihood is based upon that gives it a sense of weight and that means it's going to influence your type as well so there's like a back and forth relationship between our type and our career and so your career choice is important to understand how it's influencing you, but it also is important to understand what kind of subtype, you know, careers are best suited for you. Mm -hmm. And if you're in the quote unquote wrong career or a career that maybe is adjacent, you know, other ISFPs would love it, but for you, it's not exactly right. Yeah. It's, it's okay. It's not just that you're a unique individual as a person. That's part of it too. But it also could be that you're wired just a little differently from other ISFPs enough so that it will influence what you're attracted to and the kind of career that's right for you. So if you want to get a little bit more on where we get this material from, we did a recording, a podcast with Dr. Dario Nardi just a few episodes ago, a couple months ago. So you can look that up. And we talk about these subtypes in detail. We go through what it looks like. We under, like all the math behind what we're going to talk about today. We unpack in that episode. We don't have time for that today. But just know there are four subtypes. We detail it out. It's tied to the brain scan work that Dario's done with individuals. So he knew what best fit type they were. And then he watched the brain patterns. And so he organized it that way. It also ties into Dr. Helen Fisher's work with certain neurochemical receptors in the brain. Yeah, neurotransmitters. Neurotransmitters, excuse me, uh, like testosterone, serotonin, dopamine, estrogen. Those are the four main ones that she works with. And so we're we're, we're presenting this on a platter for you to digest today, but there's a bunch of math behind this that you can go and research on your own. Right. And we'll leave a link somewhere around this podcast so that you can go check out Dario's work on these different subtypes. So... The four different subtypes of ISFPs are the dominant, the creative, the normalizing, and the harmonizing. And these are related to how their, um, what's technically called the cognitive functions, how they prefer to engage and interact with the world. Now, if you're brand new to type, if you just are trying to wrap your head around the idea of being an ISFP at all, then we'll make sure that there's two layers going here. We'll make sure that it's accessible to you as somebody who's, you know, just looking for general career advice as an ISFP. And I think that you'll be able to spot yourself in some of these descriptions to be able, you know, to self-determine yeah. right, or listen for which subtype resonates with you the most. And also we'll throw a little bit of the more technical piece in there if you are a type geek. So the for the type geeks out there, your subtype is determined by how your cognitive functions, particularly your first two functions, your dominant auxiliary or what we call the driver and co-pilot in the car model, whether or not they have a preference for being assertive and uh, sort of pushing it, the will of those functions out to the world, hmm. or whether or not they have a preference for being receptive and taking in more information more and sort of determining it, you know, being influenced by, more influenced by the world. So one way that you could see this is that um, the first style is what's technically called the analytic version, and that's more laser targeted, more focused. And the second style is called holistic, and that's more of an open frame. It's like you're taking in more territory, but because you're taking in a, a broader peripheral, 
you're not as focused. You're not as asserting your energy out. You're more taking in a wider frame. So as we look at these, you're going to notice a pattern emerging. So let's talk about the dominant. Let's start there. What's happening with the dominant expression of the ISFP and how does that relate to careers? Okay. So if you're a dominant subtype, you tend to be more driven and confident than the other ISFPs uh, or the other ISFP subtypes. And the qualities and characteristics that come along with this are um, ambition, being very active, friendly, practical, willing to put time and energy in to succeed at whatever the goal is. Uh, they have a more in charge style. If you want to reference back to work like uh, Linda Barron's, you know, um, different styles, interaction styles, interaction styles, right? That's more of in charge. And they tend to be drawn to leadership roles or at least wanting to be their own boss. And so that's not oftentimes what we think of when we think of ISFPs. So it's important to know that there is a dominant ISFP subtype out there. And in fact, sometimes people are dominant ISFPs and really struggle to find their best fit type because this is not usually considered part of um, the ISFP stereotype. So uh, there is a strong executive functioning capacity with the subtype that allows them to quickly act on new information. So they tend to be, um, they get into action quicker maybe than other ISFPs. They have managerial skills. Hmm. There is a, um, an, a capacity to plan and then conceptualize that plan. And, um, and they do tend to have good uh, like sensory awarenesses for how to move through with their plans. And because there is a more assertive energy to this ISFP, though some of the things that mark them differently than other subtypes are things like because they're more managerial, they're more assertive, they're more leadership oriented, then they don't have as much of that creativity that other ISFPs may have. They might not be as good at listening as other ISFPs or maybe not, a, not being as reflective as we think this type usually is. But it comes with, you know, costs and benefits. What they lack in those capacities, then they're putting into a more managerial style. Yeah, so like these ISFPs, you might find at the top of like a nonprofit or maybe the pastor of a church or running a manage management, you know, in a company or something. They're often seeking leadership roles, able to execute, take the lead, get things done, uh, which we don't always associate with ISFPs, like from a from a stereotyped way. Yeah, with it, this type. Yeah, exactly. In fact, uh, there is a entrepreneurial streak to some of these ISFPs. Like mentioned, they either want to be in charge or they at least want to be their own boss. And so you're going to see them in more leadership positions than, uh, like you mentioned, than is the stereotype. And if you have ISFP preferences and you find yourself drawn to those kinds of positions, right, to being your own boss or wanting to manage and lead a team, that's not outside of, you know, that, that's, that's not inconsistent with the ISFP type preference. There yeah. is a flavor that is more attracted to that form of leadership. Yeah. So what career specifically, I don't think Dario really goes into that as much with this type as maybe some other types. Like I think when we talk about the ESFP, for example, he gives a lot of specificity on the types of careers. It's all based on the people that came in to do brain scanning. Mm -hmm. So my assumption is he didn't have as many ISFPs report their career. Well, I do think that actually they had quite a few. He had a quite a few ISFPs come in, but there is a little bit more of an openness to mm -hmm. the career choices, but you can see that there's trends. So we've already mentioned it, but being a boss, right? Leadership, uh, positions of leadership, positions of management, and uh, being willing to put yourself, you know, in a, uh, in a more directive role, I think is something that ISFPs of this subtype tend to be attracted to. But also there is a technical aspect to this this type. Uh, they have a an enjoyment of technical things or at least a, a, a grasp of them. So you can find them in places like software coding, uh, research, scientific research, and business strategy, education, policy making, healthcare. These are all areas yeah. that you're going to see this kind of dominant ISFP shows up or showing up. And then if they enter the arts, and so there is, of course, always going to be a bit of a draw, you know, to expression and art. If they enter that field, it's going to be less on the creative side than it is on the technical side. Mm. So you might see these ISFPs more mastering lighting or sound technology or, um, you know, something that is a more technical aspect of an overall production of, you know, of performance. That's fascinating. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But they're still being creative. They're still... They're still in the energy of that ISFP desire to be creative and expressive, 
it might just be a very unique way of doing it for them. Right, exactly. And uh, and unsurprisingly, this is a subtype that does well academically as well. So you might also see them as professors or teaching. Um, and, uh, and, and I think that that makes sense, combining that technical interest yeah. with a more leadership position, which might be in teaching. So that's the dominant. And technically, again, both of the first two cognitive functions, driver or dominant cognitive function and the co-pilot or auxiliary are analytic. They're, they're flavored analytic. And that's what creates that dominant subtype. Let's talk about the creative ISFP. What does the cognitive function look like here? Yeah, thank you. I don't think I mentioned what it was for dominant. So yes, both the, extra, uh, both the perceiving and judging function, if you're a type geek, so in this case, introverted feeling authenticity and extroverted sensing sensation, both of them are going to have that more assertive uh, desire or like it's going to like having that more assertive analytic energy, both of them will. And that's what creates the dominant. So for the creative subtype, uh, this is a this is an ISFP that's more social, right? Mm. And um, and there tends to be a, a bit of a flair to this ISFP. This would be the uh, perceiving function. So in this case, extroverted sensing or sensation is going to be the more analytic, assertive energy. But the judging function, in this case, introverted feeling or authenticity, that's actually going to be holistic. It's going to be more receptive. And so the drive is going to be that more perceiving aspect, which is what creates that, that creativity, actually. So in this case, uh, these are more exploratory ISFPs. They tend to have more of a maverick style. They're wanderers. They're particularly open-minded. And they don't mind stirring the pot of things, right? They can be um, a bit disruptive because they, they have a rebellious streak to them. They're usually decent at self-management. And uh, they have high rapport building skills. They're very perceptive when it comes to voice, tone, and body language. So they really pay attention to a person's presentation and get a lot from that. Uh, they can have some, even though they're good at self-managing, they can have difficulty sticking to goals. Mm. And so the challenge isn't in the self. The challenge is in making things happen. Where the dominant subtype doesn't have that challenge as much. That's a lot more tuned into executive skills. This subtype really struggles with that piece, really sort of following through and, and making it stick. This is that ISFP on the stage in the spotlight, most likely, that they didn't build the stage, they didn't create the venue, they didn't sell the tickets, but you turn the spotlight on, they get on stage and they're performing well. They're right. being creative and they're very much tuned into that performance, whatever that is, or that expression. And when I say stage, I mean possibly a literal stage or a metaphorical stage, and whatever that means. Right, whatever they're focused on. And that's... That's actually why they struggle sometimes with making things happen in the long range is because they're so focused on that artistic pursuit. They're so hyper-focused yeah. on that creative component that they forget to do things like pay the bills, right? <laughs> or do the incidentals around them. And so this might be actually more of what we think of when we think of an ISFP. We mm -hmm. think of somebody who's a little bit more head in the clouds in some ways and, and artistic you know, it's sort of rebellious, but also artistic and disruptive and having a flair, but then struggling to, you know, to remember to pay the phone bill or whatever. Yeah. Um, and so this is a more free flowing ISFP. And it's a little bit more about um, needing to needing to find the ability to commit to something, needing to build that more executive capacity to complete projects but if they do, they can be serious powerhouses. And uh, there's a lot that they have to offer. They're perceptive. They're sociable. They're imaginative. Uh, they put themselves out there, or they certainly can. And they have a more daring component to them. So because of that, they have a lot of creative potential. And they can apply it to whatever that they, you know, whatever they want to apply to. So that idea of getting immersed in artistic capacities and kind of struggling, though, with the follow through means that they're not going to be as attracted to day jobs. They're not going to be as attracted yeah. to like sitting in a chair in a cubicle and working their job as much as maybe other subtypes. They're going to want to live a little more counterculture and they're going to want to find something that suits them. So it's hard to really list all of the careers that this kind of ISFP is going to be suited for because it's very personal, right? Yeah. It's like whatever their artistic expression is, that's probably what they're going to be going for. We have an ISFP friend 
who lives in an abandoned or semi-abandoned house with like three other people and has a leather making business. Like he makes leather wallets and sells them on Etsy. Lives very like within his means and, you know, sells just enough to eke by and is wildly happy in this life. Like loves living that lifestyle because it allows him to express and create and it's extremely countercultural. I mean, that's not really a quote unquote career on paper. I'm going to live in a semi abandoned house <laughs> with some other people and make leather for a living. Mm-hmm. Like, that's a very, like, how would you call that a career? But it is his career choice in mm-hmm. life. Yep. And so I think that's the kind of thing you're speaking to is this might look very different for you as an ISFP from the traditional quote unquote career on paper in a resume of sorts. Yeah. Yeah. There's higher randomness to this type or the subtype. And so uh, finding the thing that suits you as an individual and as part of your creative expression, if you can do that, fantastic, and follow that pursuit. Although there is the danger that the creative ISFP can get a little detached from reality. And so there might be some value in finding something that is more concrete, more grounded, more down to earth, maybe even visiting some of the other subtype energy hmm. to give get that capacity to you know make a living for oneself but if you are able to find your artistic expression and ride that into the sunset then have that because that's what you're designed for i think uh platforms are really important for this type of subtype if you're an isfp listening like let's say you want to have a creative expression like etsy for example before etsy my friend would not be able to do what he's doing uh, some creative isfps end up on youtube creating channels of expression or some other type of social media expression. Like there's a bunch of opportunities now for ISFPs that are here because of platforms that may not have been here for creatives in the in the past. So I think the opportunities for creative subtype ISFPs is growing as mm-hmm. technology improves. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and that that's nice actually. Mm-hmm. It's nice that we live in a time period that really affords yeah. you know, people who are creative to be able to take advantage of the platforms other people have built in order to manifest and express that. Okay, so let's go clear to the other side. Away from the creative, the normalizing. Mm-hmm. This word normalizing sounds like the opposite of creative. Yeah. What do we mean when we say normalizing? Yeah, it actually is the opposite subtype. Uh, if For those of you that are type geeks, if the creative is about the um, analytic perceiving and holistic judging the normalizing is in reverse so the uh, the judging function in this case introverted feeling or authenticity that would be the analytic that's the more assertive energy the driver Mm -hmm. and the extroverted sensing part uh, the perceiving part rather extroverted sensing or sensation that would be the holistic the more receptive and that's what creates the normalizing subtype so these are more conventional and specialized isfps They're going to be more serious, private, focused on balance. They're steady. They have a perfectionistic streak to them. And because they're closer to the norm, they can be found anywhere in society, right? Mm. They fill a lot of different roles, actually. They are more linear and concrete. Uh, They don't like to wing it, unlike the creative ISFP that kind of lives on winging it. This is an ISFP that does not like to do that. They want to have a little bit more of a specialization and have uh, more of a control over their day-to-day experience. Yeah, these ISFPs are not going to be as lone wolf as maybe the creative types. They're, they understand the, the value in tying into a larger system, not just be on a platform like YouTube or Etsy, but actually going and showing up to a job and having a little bit of like, you know, paid vacation and some of the things that are the normal aspects of life. I think they're much more open to that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, that desire uh, is really rooted in the, the the need to not just specialize, but perfect their specialty. So they want to be able to perform in their sleep, so to speak. Specialization? Mm-hmm. Be yeah. A, be a specialist in something. Yeah, exactly. They okay. want to like hone every aspect of whatever is their personal discipline. And just be able to do it automatically without even having to think about it. That's the desire. And so that that means having more self-discipline, more discipline around the thing that you're doing as opposed to, you know, not being able to commit and kind of having more of a free form, loosey goosey life. This is this is the opposite of that. This is becoming a, a real master of whatever the discipline is. But it doesn't have to be something that is, you know, particularly 
Um, you know, it doesn't have to be something that is romantic. It can be something that is just a standard career. They can be found in all areas. And there is a lot of need for people like this, actually, in almost every arena. ISFPs that are normalizing play well with others and they play well with institutions. So unlike the creative ISFP where it's kind of hard to tell you the list of the things that the careers you can go for because it's very much about individual expression, this is the opposite. These ISFPs can go almost anywhere yeah. as long as they have a desire to learn the discipline of that particular career. But there are things that are you know, sort of favorites. Uh, because they work well in institutions, they can be both assistants and managers, right? Kind of like the dominant subtype really likes to go out for leadership. This is more of a support role. Where do you need me? You know, and uh, and so they can be patient in both of those positions. They can also get into things like um, working with an acting troupe, right? So there might be like a whole group of people who are doing this and they be, as opposed to being the lone wolf that is performing, they can be part of a group of people that is doing performance. But then they can also just as easily work in a clerical pool. There is a, uh, a, a ability to shine when connecting language with feeling and body motion. Mm. And so this shows up in design, in media, in performing arts. It shows up in education. It shows up in social work. Right, anything that can combine this idea of expression with physicality, and so teaching is a really good one, right? And uh, and other forms of media production is a good one too, but ultimately, because of their desire to self-educate, their desire to get really good at whatever it is that they're doing, can go anywhere as long as it's a place of interest. Yeah, and you can also see why maybe this style of ISFP, if you lean this way, you probably have struggled with. Am I? really an ISFP? Maybe I'm a different personality type altogether. Like maybe I'm a, a complete, maybe ISFJ or something. Cause I seem to be okay with being an institution and just doing the same thing every day. So am I still an ISFP? And just, if you notice there's this smell in the air, there's this energy of expression that runs under everything. doesn't matter which of these four, and we're going to talk about harmonizing next. There's a, there's a level of needing to express yourself. This is just the way you do it. So let's talk about that normalizing, that final subtype for ISFPs, normalizing. Oh, we just talked about normalizing. I'm um, excuse It'd me. Be harmonizing. harmonizing. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. Harmonizing. Yeah. One more note on the normalizing, though, is yeah. that there tends to be even even with the normalizing subtype, there does tend to be a little bit of a restlessness. Hmm. And so we talked about this with ESFPs, how the normalizing ESFP needs to have a hobby that's exciting or interesting, or maybe something that's like a long term project, like writing a book. The normalizing ISFP also has to have outside interests. Yeah. Their career is not going to be enough for them. And so they tend to do a lot of, like they have very interesting side hobbies that support their, whatever it is that they're applying themselves to in their day job. Yeah. And that's important, right? And I think this is probably the case for a lot of, pers well, actually, most people need to have a hobby or two <laughs> to supplement whatever they're doing in their day job. But I think this is particularly important for uh, the SFP types or the SP types who need to have their extroverted sensing or sensation um, aspect of themselves, even if that is a more chill vibe version of it, they still need to feel that sense of aliveness and they need to feel like they're in flow with the universe. And careers don't always allow for that. So making sure to have a side hobby that really connects you to that feeling of aliveness and that feeling of being sort of in the flow of the universe, whatever that means for you, yeah. that's really crucial to subsidize your day job. Yeah. Okay. So now let's talk about the harmonizing, <laughs> not the normalizing, the harmonizing, <laughs> the, the harmonizing. final one. <laughs> right. And so harmonizing subtypes are the more empathic and reflective subtype. And for uh, ISFPs, this might be actually in some ways the creative ISFP is a bit of a stereotype, but I think harmonizing is also a bit of a stereotype for ISFPs because this is the more chill vibe version. Um, this is the one that comes across as more mystical. So these, uh, the, some of the characteristics and traits of these ISFPs is caring, mystical, peaceful. Mm. They can be the most spiritual of all the types, not just of the ISFP subtypes, but like all the types. Uh, this can be one of the most spiritually inclined of the types. And they tend to work in the background as opposed to the dominant that wants to be at the forefront, the creative that wants to be in the light, or the normalizing that wants to be in the middle of the group. This is more of a behind the scenes ISFP. Yeah. And they tend to make really good counselors, teachers, healers, 
uh, and creators, not, not creative creators, but more like sort of manifesting the things that they want into the world, have very high emotional intelligence. That's one of the markers. Um, they might find themselves in artistic roles, but they also might find themselves in meditative roles or even therapeutic roles. Mm. Uh, this is a, um, a, a, a giving of the world the gifts that they have received by ob observation, right? Yeah. That they're receiving a lot of information and considering the implication of it. And so what they, where they really shine is when they can share what they have observed. I've seen ISFPs that are harmonizing struggle with thinking sometimes they're INFJs, as an example. They're so tapped into the intuition, into picking up psychic energy from other people, the therapeutic nature of human, like, you know, tapped into what's going on for other humans. They almost have this sense. And sometimes they struggle, like, am I an INFJ or am I an ISFP? And they can go back and forth because of this particular expression of ISFP. Mm -hmm. Like you said, it's much more, I think there's like a shamanistic or spiritual or esoteric nature to them. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so I think a lot of the career choices are going to lend themselves that way. Yeah, very much so. This is an ISFP that identifies with INFJ preferences because they're more, op I mean, there there's a, there's a deeply intuitive feeling inside of them. The it's really actually playing off of the the visceral sensory information they're getting yeah. and some of the connections they're making from that. Like they they can see and spot abstract patterns, particularly when they are personally there, when they're feeling and seeing seeing what's happening in a situation, and that feels a lot like intuition, um, that a capacity to sort of read what's happening for another person. And they are more open-ended, right? There's less of a definitive feeling from them. It's less of a, an assertive, like, this is how things have to be. There's more of an openness that, um, that I think we don't always assign to ISFPs. We think, see them as being more convicted. Yeah. And this ISFP is a little bit more like, oh, well, let's, you know, let's kind of see the situation and feel our way through it. I'm glad you said conviction, because I would like to just take a moment. Which of these subtypes, I suspect the dominant subtype and the normalizing subtype are going to be the most convicted of all the subtypes because i think conviction is a through line as well as self-expression i think at least my personal experience with isfps in my life conviction is a mat like a a huge piece of their life mm -hmm. for all of them yeah and i would say those two types would you agree to that that mm -hmm. those two types are the most likely to come across with that conviction frame yeah this well, is how it has to be i think all introverted feeling types so fps if you're new we're talking about people who has who have fp preferences they all use introverted feeling or authenticity as their decision making function and all people who have this function as a strength are very aware of how they feel about things like what they like and dislike what they think is right or wrong there is there's going to always be a natural tapping into that energy yeah. but when it has an analytic preference which is that sort of assertive focused preference that's when there's a tendency to be on a crusade Right. There's like a, there's a definitiveness to it. There's an assertiveness of what has already been concluded and figured out. When introverted feeling or authenticity has a more holistic flavor to it, it's still in touch with what it likes and dislikes and the things that mean something. But it tends to be more reflective about the self. It's more exploring how things are making it feel as opposed to, you know, getting to a place of quick conclusion making around it. And so... If people who have the analytic version are on a crusade, people who have the holistic version are, uh, they have like a lot of little crusades, like a little, little things that mean something to them. And so you might only run into that thing when it's, you know, it's been triggered. <laughs> like you might not know that this is really important to this person until the situation triggers it, yeah. as opposed to somebody with the analytic version, which is going to be like they're they're leading with it. They're letting you know before they even get there what's important to them. So the dominant and the nor normalizing, which taps into that more assertive analytic version, that they're going their positions are going to be a little bit more obvious. Yeah. So as we move back again to the harmonizing subtype, out of the four expressions of ISFP, they're probably the most open and less convicted. I mean, they still have access to that conviction like you talked about. They probably aren't leading with that all the time. They're probably not going through life on a cause or a mission 
they're more open and letting the energy come to them. Mm -hmm. And so careers that they choose or the type of work that they end up doing or you know, the vocation they go into is probably going to lend itself to more of that openness, mm -hmm. less of a crusade I'm on and more of a support or you know, gathering energy, letting it come into me, letting letting the energy come to me onto, onto my turf. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Again, this is going to be more of a counselor, a healer. We talked about with ESFPs that are harmonizing, they can even be shamans. The same deal with ISFPs that yeah. are more harmonizing. They might even have a shamanistic streak. Or it might not necessarily have to be, you know, specifically spiritual. It can simply be therapeutic. So I think you're going to see them in a lot of different roles where they're helping guide another person or other people to finding that person helping find them their best self or something that really allows a person to work through a healing time period in their life they're like guiding they're almost like guides and there's a peaceful strength to these isfps that makes them particularly suited for that kind of work mm. uh, the challenge well and then there's another component which is that because they're so tapped into all of this and they're they've got that sort of um, intuition that comes from the visceral piece their their connection isn't just to humans it's also to nature it's to animals it's to a world that's a little bigger than just the interaction of sort of the systems that humans have set up so there might yes. be a naturalistic streak here too and that might make them very attracted to taking care of animals maybe something like a vet or um, a person who works you know maybe in a zoo or something something where they can be close to animals and then also to nature maybe they're a guide right like um, a, a nature guide or somebody who oh yeah works like horticulture works closely with nature that makes a lot of sense so as you look at this, if you're an ISFP, you have an ISFP in your life, just start to think in terms of the principles and energies behind each of these subtypes. Clearly, your cognition is ISFP preferences. I like to think of it as like, that's the song uh, written down on the paper. Those are the musical notes. And then these four subtypes are the performance of that song. That's the expression of the song that is you, the ISFP song that is you. Mm -hmm. And so as you're listening along, if you're an ISFP, which one of these are you starting to identify with? And are you in the right career based on the energies and the things you're attuned to? If you're a dominant subtype, are you in a role that's more harmonizing or, or creative or normalizing? Like, are you doing a career that lends itself to the way you show up to the world? Right. Well, it's one thing you could ask yourself. Absolutely. And there are going to be some ISFPs. I mean, I didn't mention this with harmonizing, but in some ways, harmonizing subtypes are the most at home when they're in some other world. Mm. Whereas the normalizing is the exact opposite. Like yeah. they're most at home when they're in this world and problem solving in this world and the dominant as well. So there might be, you know, that you might be the kind of ISFP that needs a job that accounts for the fact that you kind of don't feel super tethered to this, yeah. you know, to this reality. Or the opposite is true. You might be an ISFP that very much needs to tether to this reality and do concrete problem solving and manage things. And, you know, it's like, so... The subtype really does flavor things. And then, as we mentioned before, your career choice is going to influence what kind of ISFP you are. And so if you have chosen to, you know, go into a career that requires a normalizing way of looking at things, you might have become a more normalizing ISFP just because of circumstances. Yeah. And you might want to develop, like something might be calling you. It might be a transition time or a career change time where you could make a lateral move or, or maybe even, you know, get a bump up the, the next rung on the ladder of your career tra trajectory. But there might be something calling you that is in one of these more creative pursuits or something that it's a little bit more naturalistic or spiritual. And if that's the case, it's not necessarily that you can't survive there or thrive there. It might be time to visit another flavor or style of ISFP. Yes. And that's the other piece of it or vice versa. So another piece of it isn't just what is the right career for me. It's like what kind of person do I want to be at the end of all of this? And your career choice is going to influence that. Dario was a little nervous to call these subtypes because he was concerned people would think, oh, that's who I am. Right. You're an ISFP. That's how your cognition is wired. But again, these are expressions and so I could just, let me just anecdotally say this. I could see somebody that's a creative subtype of an ISFP in their early life, maybe their early 20s, late 20s, whatever, as a performer. They're on stage, they're performing, they're in the energy of it, they're that creative subtype. And then as they mature over time, maybe the career starts to alter. Maybe they're not on stage as much. Maybe they start to tap more into the normalizing aspect of who they are. 
And now they're helping to run things, maybe the sound in the theater to help the people that are on the stage as they get older. In other words, they're facilitating other people getting up to perform, other creatives. No, or they stay creative the whole time. But these are open to you. You can flex and flow between these energies, I guess is what we're trying to say. You're not locked into, oh, well, I'm a dominant. That's all I can be. That's all I can do. No, you can lean into other aspects of yourself. Right. That same ISFP that started out on stage might end up directing. Yeah. And now they're in the dominant position. Exactly. Or they might end up finding themselves on a spiritual path and now they're in counseling and now they're in the harmonizing version. Yeah. So there is there is definitely a capacity to flex and flow through all of these. But finding the one that is going to feed your soul right now and then understand how it, like, like what lane is it putting you in and then realizing that you can do personal growth basically in development through career choice and become you know, a different style and and have all of that open to you. So our encouragement to you, if you're an ISFP or you're helping an ISFP in your life, think about this not so topical. Like, well, the internet says I've got to do these 10 jobs and that's what I'm equipped for. Think of it more energetically. Like, which of these subtypes do I tend to see expressing from myself and then what are the career choices that would really fit the way I like to express my ISFP nature? We believe that coming from a principled approach, you're going to find a career path that's going to let your soul sing. It's going to speak to who you are. It's going to allow you to tailor your life ergonomically and design it to support you, to feed you, to energize you, not take from you. So I think that's really what we're going to land is think about this from a principled energetic approach rather than a topical internet research-based approach yeah. to careers. <laughs> Even though that list was actually pretty good. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't It wasn't off. It just is very overgeneralized. It's yeah. not just those one things. So what do you think? You've been listening along. Maybe you're an ISFP or you know an ISFP. What's coming up for you? If you are an ISFP, what is your current career? What are some of the career paths you've had in your life? What would you love to be doing on a career? We'd love to hear that. Come over directly below this episode, personalityhacker.com. Leave a comment, ask a question. More importantly, share your story, your career story. What have you found working for you? Does this idea of these subtypes resonate with you as you're thinking about it? You're like, wow, well, no wonder I'm struggling. I'm in the wrong career. I need to be a career more in this energy. That's where I could express myself more. That's where I could feel more alive and more who I am. We want to hear from you. Come over. You haven't had a microphone, but now is your chance to make your voice heard. Yeah. And I'll also make sure that a link or we'll make sure that a link is here to uh, reference uh, Dario's work because it's it's good stuff. Yeah. If you enjoyed this podcast, you can subscribe to us on iTunes and various Android platforms. If you leave a rating and review for us on iTunes, it spiritually helps me out. <laughs> I love reading the reviews. I go, oh, somebody's listening. Oh, and this is what they thought of it. So if you leave a rating and a review... I'd be super grateful. You take it as a sign of encouragement. I do. Like, oh, okay. I can keep going. I get I feedback. I know how it's landing. I can keep going. Yeah, I love on feedback. So if I don't get any, if it's crickets, I'm like, oh, well, okay, I guess we got to shut it down. <laughs> That's not a threat. Uh, we also have this on iTunes, excuse me, on YouTube. All right, where am I at in my spiel? Uh, we have a video podcast. You might be watching it right now on YouTube. If you enjoyed it, you can leave us a, uh, a rating there or a, a thumbs up or a like, and you can also subscribe to us. Smash that like button, subscribe to us, and hit the little bell that lets you know when a new episode is out. We have a book. It's called Personality Hacker. You can get it at all major book retailers. And if you leave us a rating and review on Amazon, that also helps us out a lot. And if you are curious do I have ISFP preferences? I'm not sure. You can head over to personalityhacker.com and take our absolutely free assessment. Figure out uh, what your type preferences are. And that at least is the be a fantastic beginning of your journey in discovering your best fit type. So head over to personalityhacker.com and look for the free assessment. My name is Joel Mark Witt. And I'm Antonia Dodge. And we'll talk with you on the next Personality Hacker Podcast. Mm -hmm.